about motherhood. One minute, your mom of the year. I love you, mommy. Then the next? <laughs> mm, not so much. From bath time to bullying, from potty training to puberty, parenting is full of challenges. But one thing is for certain, you are not alone. Welcome to Modern Mom Probs. I'm your host, author, mother, parenting expert, Tara Clark. Join me while we tackle today's Modern Mom Problems. Welcome back to another episode of Modern Mom Probs. I'm your host, Tara Clark. If you like what we're doing here, be sure to subscribe. Today's topic is how to be intentional with your spending. And I am joined by Megan Dwyer. She is on a mission to remove the stigma around money in our culture so that women can begin to step into their own light and make choices free of fear. She's the host of the Money Isn't Scary podcast, which takes you on her own personal journey with money. Megan is a certified financial planner, and she loves running, writing, and snuggling with her little boys and empowering women to be their best selves. Megan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be doing this. One, I want to say today's St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Thank you. Top of the morning to you as well. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I feel like we might as well mention that. And by the time this comes out, it's going to be like way after. But yeah, I just wanted to go ahead and, and be the first one to wish you happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so as I mentioned, you're the host of the Money Isn't Scary podcast. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what motivated you and inspired you to start it. Yeah. So I started the podcast for so many reasons, actually, but let me back up a little bit so I can give you a little bit of an understanding of where I was in life at that time, right? So I started the podcast about two years ago. It was actually kind of right in the height of the pandemic. And I was working full time from home. I had two little boys who are at the time were four and two, I think, somewhere around there, because they're six and four now. And there, I was juggling a lot, like so many other women and moms were at that time. My husband had lost his job. He actually lost a couple of jobs in a row. And I had a lot of pressure on me, I think, at that time. And I felt really overwhelmed. And one of the reasons why I started the podcast in the first place was because I found myself spending a lot more. I was, because you couldn't go into stores really, I was doing a lot of online shopping. And something would arrive and I all of a sudden I would throw it in my closet and I'd realize like, it's just going to sit there. It just sits there. And then every so often I'll, I'll walk by and I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot I got that, but I have nowhere to go and I have nothing to use it for right now, right? Like this bag or this new pair of shoes. And it just got me sort of thinking about the the reason why I was doing this. And so as I was like thinking through this, I was realizing that I was trying to fill a void, right? There was something deeper that was making me do this shopping. That, right? That plus the fact that working as a financial planner on a daily basis, I was seeing a ton of scarcity from our clients. Like at that time, of course, it was a crazy time. But even be- before that, I would work with a lot of clients and I would like, you know, run the numbers and I would run the long-term projections. And I would say over and over again, like, you're going to be okay. Like, you're going to be fine. You can go on that vacation. You can, you know, go build the house. You could go do whatever you want to do. Like, you're going to be okay. And over and over again, they would not believe me. Not everybody, but a lot of times people, people just would say, are you sure? Are you sure I can, I can retire when I want to? Are you sure I can make this gift? Are you sure I can do this? And it just got me again, sort of really questioning, like, why do, why do we do these things? Like, why do we think this way? Those are kind of two examples of why I really wanted to dive into the behavioral stuff behind the, behind money. That plus the fact that I always say, if I could go back and do life all over again, I would study psychology and I would be a therapist because I'm fascinated by human behavior. So the podcast, starting the podcast was, was my way of kind of marrying those two passions that I have. And it also became an outlet for me. It became my own kind of way of processing my big feelings and what I was going through at that time, because, oh my gosh, it was an emotional, crazy time for everybody. Yeah, it really was. And going back to the the spending too, it's like when we were buying things, like we weren't actually even going places. So we're like buying clothes and shoes and bags for some day that when we were going to be able to to go back into things. And then you know what? Two years later, you're like, oh, I forgot I had this. 
Totally. I remember buying headbands. I was, I'm a big headband person. <laughs> I remember buy, going online, like J crew online and seeing like this tie dye, like fun headband. And in my head thinking like, oh, I have to have this because I need a little more fun in my life. Right. Even though I know I'm not going to go anywhere, but maybe just wearing the headband will make me seem more fun or make me feel like I'm having more fun in my own house in this world right now. And so that's what made me sort of realize like, maybe it's not the thing itself. Maybe it's the feeling behind the thing that we're buying. So that took me on this, on this journey. And so two years later, here I am. And, and I, I love doing the podcast because I realized how universal all of these concepts are. Like you think it's something little that maybe you know, you, it triggers you or just something like, you know, a trip to target or something like that, but there's so much more meaning behind it that I don't, I think a lot of us don't stop and slow down and and actually process. Yeah. I think that's a big thing. For me, I always used to love the rush of going to the store and picking up something special. Right. And whether Mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know, piece of fast fashion from Target or a different store or, you know, like some sort of snacky treat for yourself. I've become much more intentional about my spending in the last few years. And I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or I don't know if it's because I think more about spending for my son or I just save, you know, I think that's a big part of it too. Now with the economy being how it is and with inflation being how it is, I think many people are more intentional with with the price of eggs being what they are. Oh my gosh. Yeah. (laughs) Many people are intentional. Inflation will do that. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, we actually stopped buying it. We don't really eat eggs very often, but I use them for baking. And so, you know, I'll have a dozen eggs that'll be in my refrigerator for way too long. And then once I realized what the price was, I was like, I'm not even going to bake as frequently because why bother? Yeah. I don't, I don't need well, to eat cake anyway. I mean, I love it <laughs> and I like to make cake cause it's fun, but that wasn't like a necessity for us. Yeah. I mean, and that I think goes back to the, I think the whole idea of being intentional and what is it, right? Like what, what is being intentional around your money and how you spend your dollars? And to be honest, I think that so many women and moms in particular struggle with this because this all is inner work. And this is a lot of kind of introspection and self-awareness. And when we're busy, as I like to say, when we're on this treadmill and we just get up and we're, we're rushing, rushing, rushing to do a million things during the day for everybody else, we forget, we forget about what we even want and who we even are. So I think that just slowing the role right? For like a couple minutes and just spending some time with yourself to actually understand like, Hey, who am I? What do I even like to do? Because I think we having kids, you know, sometimes we lose our identity and I know I have (laughs) for sure. And I'm starting to find that person again, but my gosh, I, for the longest time when I had babies, I was trying to be the person that I thought I should be, or that culture told me I should be, or my mother-in-law told me I should be right. Or clinging on to the me of the past, right? Like, which I'm a different person now. And I think when we go through transitions like that, and motherhood is a huge transition for for those who, have, who go through it, we really need to like take some time to pause and reflect and say, okay, where are we now? And who am I? And how do I really want to live my life, right? Well, how do I want to feel? That's the big question. How do I want to feel? Yeah. And, and that's a question that, I mean, I think individuals ask themselves all the way through their lives, but I think there's something about motherhood that really makes us face that head on, right? Yeah. Because you're feeling in a certain way where you do not feel the same person. You realize that you had a loss of identity. You're like, what happened to me? I look in the mirror. I'm not the same fun person that I used to be. Now I'm like a tired, cranky mess, <laughs> right? You're like, mm-hmm. we're tired, cranky messes now. But I, I think that it's important to sort of face that head on. And, and I think a lot of that starts with awareness. Lately, my skin has been so dry, like cracked, flaky dry, and tight, so tight, especially on my face. I recently started using Codex Labs skin care products, including the Sia Hydrating Skin Superfood, the Nourishing Facial Oil, and the Unscented Soap. 
Since I have sensitive skin, their unique plant-based microbiome-friendly formula hydrated and smoothed my skin without making it feel heavy or irritating it. The nourishing facial oil was so light that it made my skin feel like silk. I absolutely love how it made my face feel so soft and fresh again. Head over to codexlabscore.com to learn more. My listeners receive a 20% off discount for using code MODERNMOM20. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, you know, we don't take the time to do it. One of the things I, I just was helping somebody earlier this week with going through an exercise of figuring out our, our core values. And have you ever seen this before? I feel like I did this at, for a workshop, like at work 10 years ago or something, but it's just like a page that has all these different values on it. And you start and you just go through the list and you start to pick your top like 10 or 15. And then from there, you kind of narrow that down to like three to five of like that, that's, that are the most important to you. And when you start to realize, like zone into what are, what is important to you, it's kind of cool because you realize like, oh, okay, that's really why I get up every day. This is what I want. This, this is what I want with my life. This is how I want to feel. And I think we just need those reminders every so often. So do you, you think it's like something so simple and obvious, right? But I think doing little exercises like that is so important for people to kind of be, be reminded because we forget we're so busy. Yeah, we we really are. Well, one of my friends, Pamela Peckerman, she was on the podcast several episodes ago and she talks about, she she's a business coach and an entrepreneur coach. And she talks about having a value-driven business and being a value-driven entrepreneur. And I think this actually applies to people across the board. And what she says is that you should find your top three values and your business and your work all go towards that. And one of her top three values is flexibility. And she mm. does not include the word family in that, in her top three. And, and she says, I'll explain why I use flexibility instead of family. She said, everything that I do for my business, I want to be flexible so that I can be with my family. And I thought that was so interesting because usually when people say, oh, well, what are the top three most important things to you? And you're like, my family, my health, you know, money. I don't know, you know what other yep. people say, but usually they do include family as part of that. And she says, I don't include family in that. I include flexibility because I want to be the owner of my own time so that I could choose to spend that time with my family. And I thought that yeah. was really interesting, the concept of flexibility. And and then, you know, I, I, I told her, I was like, I'm going to steal that and use that for myself too, because that's what I love about the work that I do is that I'm able to make my own hours and be flexible so that I can be with my son and my husband. Yeah. I mean, I was just going to say the opposite too. So, so making flexibility at work so you can be with your family and then vice versa. So mm -hmm. having flexibility at home so you don't feel like you're kind of trapped, right? Mm -hmm. So you can still go be the person that you want to be. And I'm not saying go back to work. I mean, like, or we'll go back and do work. I mean, like, you know, go do yoga or go do get like, go for a run or yeah. do what is important to, to you to make you feel like a whole person again, like a whole human being with yeah. balance. You're not just, you're not just your job and you're not just a mom. You're so much more than that. And I think we forget that. I do anyway. I yeah. Do. We get, we get lost so, in it. Yeah. And you just, and you, you, again, like you wake up on a Monday morning and you just, you're on this treadmill all week long. And even, and then you, and then you, sh for me anyway, it's like I'm all day at work. Then I've got a mom at night. And then on the weekends, maybe there's a little bit extra time that I could go do one thing for myself for like an hour or two, but you're still full-time momming. And then by the time you get back into it on Monday, again, you're exhausted. Like you feel depleted. You feel kind of mm -hmm. like you didn't have the time and the space for yourself. And for me, I'm an emotional person and I cry. I'm just a crier. Like it could be sad. It could be, I could be overwhelmed. I could be happy. I'll cry at anything. And there's some days that I just kind of, once, once I get the kids off to school and then I finally have some time to myself, I might sit down at my desk and I'm just like, Oh my gosh, like, <laughs> what am I even doing? What do I want to do? Right. And I know yeah. I have to work. I know I've got that to do, but do I, do I want to No. Because I didn't take the time for myself that I needed. I did, or if I did, it wasn't fulfilling enough time, right? Mm -hmm. and that's where I think like the intention comes into things. Let's like, so here's an example. You know, a lot of times, like we'll go and 
like you said, kind of go buy that fast fashion, right? At, at Target or wherever, because we want that quick dopamine hit. We want mm-hmm. some kind of feeling of freedom or feeling of, I am the confidence maybe, or maybe, you, you know what I mean? Like maybe you just had a really terrible morning and you're just like fried, you're overwhelmed, depleted, and you just need something to kind of make you feel better. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think what we need to do is like recognize that that's not probably going to, that's going to be a short-term feeling, short-term, you know, kind of high that you're going to get versus like, if you saved your money and because you really wanted this like nice bag or whatever, a pair of shoes or something like that, and that's more expensive, you it, it's almost more fulfilling when you actually do that, when you get that one item, because you know, it's nicer, you know, it's more quality, you know, you've, you've kind of saved the money and you've worked towards that. And, the, and you've had that kind of intention in mind, right? That goal that like, that's what I want versus like the little kind of impulse buys, like I like to say. So I just feel like it's a more genuine, authentic feeling of fulfillment when you go and put the intention behind something. That's just an example, right? I'm not saying that like it, that, that, that is like the one thing that is like that, right? Or the, the that same concept, but you know, it could be anything. It could be like, I think, I think a lot of times we tell ourselves that we can't have that nice bag or we can't have that vacation because, you know, maybe we don't deserve it, or maybe we don't let ourselves have the things that we want to have because we don't need it. Right. Or we can't afford it. And I think those stories we need to challenge those stories that we tell ourselves because it can be really damaging. And it's, and it just kind of continues this cycle of living an unfulfilled life. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that there's a lot to be said about that. Like if I were to describe my teens and twenties, it definitely would be impulse buys. I feel like, you know, we're spending a lot of time at the mall and I was buying a lot of fast fashion and I was trying to get that dopamine hit. And when I think back now, I'm like, gosh, I can't even imagine all the money I would have had, had I not just like spent it on crap. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And the other thing too, around that is, you know, I, I do the same. I, I think like, again, if we think about the underlying feeling at that time of my life, I just wanted to fit in. So mm-hmm. I wanted to have what everybody else had because I felt maybe I felt insecure about myself or, or, or whatever. I felt like I didn't feel confident enough, but if I had that thing, that everybody else had, or I wore those clothes, then, you know, maybe I would, I would feel like I fit in. I would feel like everybody else. So when you go back to that, like ultimate, like, what are we craving here? What are we looking for? Like you, it's fascinating sometimes. It really is. It really is. I mean, my hope for the younger generations is that they won't need to seek out having a certain label or certain clothes yeah. to to get that fulfillment. And so I think that's why it's important for like us to do the hard work as parents that we can instill that in our children as well. Right. Absolutely. And that's, this is such, it is such hard work. It's like breaking those generational patterns, right? And you have to catch yourself. It's not easy. And there's days where you're just like, oh my God, this is so hard, but it's so worth it. And you know, you're doing the best you can. Nobody taught us this. (laughs) Yeah. If anything, I mean, in my family, my mom probably taught me the scarcity mindset more than that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Same. Yeah. Her parents grew up in the great depression. So they always had the scarcity mindset that they passed down to her and now she's living with it. And when you were telling the story about working with people who are planning their retirement and they're like, no, no, we won't have enough money. That's her in her mind. Like she is always, you know, one day away from calamity And it's like, mom, no, it's okay. Like you've literally worked your entire life and saved your entire life for this. It's okay. You could enjoy yourself. She actually, at this point, full disclosure, just started a new job because she wasn't ready to retire. So she can retire. She chooses not to. And and I respect that because you know what? She wants to get out there and meet people and talk with people. And so I completely understand. Yeah. As long as she's not doing it from a place of fear, like knowing that she can't, right? Because that's a lot of people just say, I work with clients all the time that are like, oh, I need to keep working because the economy is where it is or the market's down or whatever. And I'm like, wait, like, no, <laughs> let's think about the real reason. Maybe it's because you've been working your entire life and maybe you don't know what you're going to do with yourself right now, right? There's so many other bigger issues. And I think we make excuses for them. You know. <laughs> that is absolutely the case over here. So I that really resonates with me. So traditionally, women tend not 
to speak about money, right? It's been something that's mm-hmm. sort of taboo, especially when it comes to salaries. And so like, how do you think that we can start the conversation about saving, about retirement so that we don't have that scarcity mindset that maybe our mothers have? Yeah. So honestly, I think there's a few steps here. I think, first of all, you have to be comfortable with it yourself. Like you have to have a healthy relationship with money yourself. You've got to work through your own stuff, you know, start to recognize those stories that come up and just understand yourself a little bit more. I think like, because this isn't easy and you're going to be in a situation where, you know, you might start, you might talk to somebody else about it and all of a sudden you're going to get triggered. So you've got to have that kind of like core foundation of, of feeling comfortable with where you're at with money and the way that you process things. And that requires massive amounts of self-compassion too. So I actually talked with, I had her on my show, Dr. Kristen Neff. She is like the leading like pioneer in self-compassion research. And she, it was an incredible conversation. I can't wait to, to air it. It'll be out in a couple of weeks, but it's so important. There's different components to this, like, but having, that like component of self-compassion there allows you to do this in a way that you're not going to beat yourself up for past mistakes. You're not going to beat yourself up for what you think may happen in the future. You can just be content with where things are today. Right. And so I think, you know, having that kind of base knowledge of where you're at, a healthy relationship with your money. And a component to that is some basic financial education if you haven't had that before. And that's okay. One of my biggest pet peeves is that we don't learn this stuff in school. They don't teach us this. So I think just starting to be curious and have an understanding of what you own, what you have, what your debt situation is, what you've got for income, what your expenses are, high level, that's all you need to do to start, right? Just to have an awareness of where things are. And then we can start to talk to other people about it. And what I would suggest is do this in a safe place to start. You need to find your people. You can't just like go out into the world and start talking to anybody about this because the stigma is like still so alive and well. We need to find people who are on the same journey with us. And believe me, like I have done this before. I have tried to talk money and open up and have these like deep conversations around how we feel about money with a group of friends before. And like, it didn't go well. Right. And I felt so awkward afterwards because I was trying, but I just realized like, this isn't the right group of people. Like maybe these, they're not ready. Maybe they just don't want to, and maybe they'll never be ready. And that's okay. That's, that's, that's the end. Like that's you do you. But you need to find your people who are, who want to do this with you. So that's why, you know, I'm going to be doing a workshop this spring where I'm trying to develop like a a group of people who are willing to, to, to talk and to work through this stuff on their own. And I'm willing to share, of course. And I'm trying to form a community of like minded women on Facebook because I want to create the safe place for people to feel comfortable and vulnerable and share things that, you know, maybe they've never shared with anybody else before. I've been trying to work on mindfulness with my son by introducing him to meditation techniques. And in doing this, I realized, you know, Tara, you could really benefit from meditation too. What else is a better way to start good habits than by modeling them, right? So I started listening to the Women's Meditation Network. It has all different types of podcasts from anxiety meditation to sleep to morning meditation. Personally, I really enjoy the daily affirmations because they're just about 10 minutes long, which is just right for me and my schedule. Whether you're an experienced meditator or you're just getting started, check out Women's Meditation Network wherever you listen to podcasts. I love that. I think that's so important because I've never spoken about money with any of my in real life friends. I've only ever really spoken about money with my content creator friends because I see us as peers. And so then we're talking about rates for sponsored posts or something like that. And so it's not exactly the same thing about, you know, saving for retirement, but it is still talking about how much you're worth and, and making sure that you are getting paid accordingly because 
with content creation, it's sort of the wild, wild west sometimes where one person can make X amount and then the other person is going to make 5X on virtually the same thing. And so it's a tricky thing to navigate, but the more content creators talk about it, the more co-workers talk about this kind of stuff, the more the media talks about it, newspapers, that sort of thing. I think it's really important to have these conversations so that you feel empowered to get paid what you're worth. Absolutely. And it is starting to become more mainstream, uh, way more than it was 10 years ago, or you know, when even when we were growing up, when we were kids. And that's awesome. And I'm psyched for that. And I think that's like, that's momentum, but there's so much work that needs to be done. And we can't just rely on other people to do it. We have to start with ourselves. So again, we need to be able to seek out a safe place in order to have those conversations. And, and again, you know, be curious, be curious about yourself and take this with like no judgment, because again, like the way I see this is like, we're just, we're all in this together. Like we sometimes feel like, you know, again, we are because of culture, because of social media, because of all this stuff that's out there, this whole keeping up with the Joneses thing. And just the fact that money in our culture has always been seen as the status thing. We tend to feel shame and we feel bad about ourselves if we have less than somebody or if we have more than somebody. And we have no idea. We have absolutely no idea because people don't talk about it. So I think what we need to do is just assume that everybody's on a level playing field. Everybody is where they're supposed to be. Where, where they are, where they're supposed to be. And we don't need to compare ourselves to one person or another. Easier said than done though, because we've been cultured to do that. We've been conditioned to think that somebody is more successful if they happen to have more money or, you know, the bigger house or the the nicer car or whatever it is. But we have to, we have to really question that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny, you were just saying something and it made me think about people talking about millennials with like avocado toast and overpriced yes. lattes and stuff like that. Yeah. And like, that's the reason we don't have houses. And that's the reason why we don't have 401ks. So like, what's your take on that? Okay, well, first of all, I, there's a meme out there that I've posted <laughs> a few times before, I think, because it's so important. That's like, okay, let's do the math here. Like a latte, if you get like, you know, a latte three times a week and it's whatever, $5 each, that's $15 a week and $15 a week over the course of a year, over the course of 10 years is going to be like $3,000, whatever it is. It's a very insignificant amount of money. It's not enough to buy yourself a house. So let's like, first of all, just back up and recognize that. I mean, I think that we judge ourselves and we shame ourselves If you want the latte, do you, if you, I don't like, I personally don't like coffee. I do like avocado toast, but I wouldn't say that I'm going (laughs) to, it's really good, but I wouldn't say that I I get avocado toast every time I go out. I mean, but I, I just don't think there's anything wrong with that. If that's what you like, I think that there has to be this balance. Not everybody's going to like everything. And I think we have to kind of, again, it all goes back to intention. It goes back to what we like and what we don't like. If you like coffee, cool. You do you. I like running. So I'm going to spend my dollars on a new pair of running shoes because that's important to me. Like there's, and I think that's okay. As long as it's kind of within your budget. I mean, you still have to understand the basics. You have to know what's coming in, what's, what's coming in, not only gross, but net after taxes, you have to know what's going out, what you're actually spending and kind of what that difference is. What's that gap? Is there a deficit? Is there a surplus? And how do, how should we be thinking about that? That's the financial planner hat that I'm wearing. But within that, you still have to give yourself a little bit of fun. I mean, you have to allow yourself, like I have a client that I work with who has been things, she, she got divorced and things are pretty tight money wise, but we make sure that she has a certain amount of money allotted every month that for TJ Maxx, she loves going to TJ Maxx. It makes her happy. And I'm not going to take that away from her. I'm not going to tell her she can't have that. I mean, I don't think there's, we need to be restricted. I think we just, we need to live our lives. And once we finally like understand ourselves a little bit more, then we won't feel that guilt and shame about it. Yeah, I I totally agree. And I going back to what you were saying, it's like, I don't think that we need to be restrictive, but I think we do need to be intentional. And Mm -hmm. so I think there's, it's important to point out the difference between the two. Yeah. And we, we don't need to, I don't want to say that we just should say, screw it. I'll, I'll buy whatever feels good to me. Like, of course we have to do that within reason and we have to we have to have the education around our own personal finance. I mean, that's like the biggest 
the biggest concept here. Like we, I want women in particular to own it. I want them to, to not default and take the backseat to your spouse or your dad. A lot of, I still know a lot of people who might be married with children who still have their dads in, involved in their money. And I'm just like, ah, really? Get out oh, yeah. of here. I know some people, of course. Yeah. Wow. You just yeah, and my that, mind. Yeah, no, that's, it's, it's, it happens. I have clients that ha- still have their, their parents kind of to an extent controlling some aspect of their money, especially if it's family money or there's, you know, an inheritance or something like that. But I think that you can't just let somebody else handle it for you. Because again, I've seen so many times there people get divorced, people pass away, things happen, unfortunately. And like, you can't just give up all your power. You have to Un- know it and understand, believe me, there's been many occasions where I've had women that have come to me that didn't know anything, didn't work, didn't even know what they had. And they're piecing things together after the fact. And I've had to hold their hand and be like, okay, like what accounts do you have here? What's the logins for this? What is the, and, and it's, it, it can be hard if you don't have a general knowledge base, but you know, I think if I think if we start to get again, it goes back to that curiosity. If we get curious and we want to know, and we ask the right questions, or I mean, Google's a massive tool. We were just talking about Google. Google Google tells us everything. Like Google's so reliable, and there's some great resources out there. And just ask questions. I really think that this all comes down to, again, your. I think the way that we think about money is the way that we think about ourselves. I think there's a lot of parallels in those relationships. And once we start respecting ourselves, then we can start to take the steps to sort of move forward and respect what we do with our money. So beautifully said, Megan, tell everyone where we could find you online. Yeah. So you can listen to the podcast. Um, Money isn't scary. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, it's out there everywhere. And you can find me on Instagram, just at money isn't scary. And I, I have a Facebook community. I have a Facebook group called the Money Mindful Mamas. And that's just, you know, where we're I'm trying to develop that community and start to bring more, more awareness to a group of like-minded women and, and just have them know that again that we're not, we're all in this together. I'm so glad we're having this conversation because it really is important. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. This is this was so fun. Thanks. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Modern Mom Probs. I hope you enjoyed our deep dive in today's problem with me, your host, Tara Clark. Join me next time when I'll be interviewing another great guest and tackling another modern mom problem. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review and a rating. As always, you could head over to Modern Mom Probs on Instagram and give me a follow or check out my book, Modern Mom Probs, A Survival Guide for 21st Century Mothers, available online wherever books are sold. Well, that's it for today. See you next time, folks.